Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. Thank you very much for joining me once again. You are always most welcome. So today, a bit more a serious subject than recently perhaps, with our Matchbox March fun recently, but we're back to the 40th anniversary of the Falklands War. Subject that's of great interest to me. Um, so I've got a few bits of model memorabilia out for you. I wanted actually to talk about some of the things I haven't already covered really, which is um, to do with the land war and, and various other facts and interesting sort of tidbits of information that weren't really apparent to many of us when we used to watch this on the daily evening news. Um, I've done quite a bit of research, not professing to be an expert on the subject at all, but I've read quite a lot of stuff now and I've watched a lot of documentaries as well. I've also got some new new things to show you. got some very interesting books, uh, Air War in the Falklands by Christopher Chant, and just an example of some of the sort of 40th anniversary stuff that's out in the shops at the moment. We've got the Aeroplane magazine, so I'm going to talk about that as well. Um, but I thought I'd just sort of recap, if you like. We talked about um, the sort of how the war basically started. Um, what, what I didn't say was about some of the background, which is quite strange. I mean, there's a long, you know, 200 years basically of, uh, of history on this subject, really, about the uh, territorial claim to the Falklands. So I'm not going to get into the rights and wrongs of it. All I will say is that the islands were discovered by the British. And then there was this thing where the French got had it for a, or sort of landed there um, on West Falkland. And then there was landing on East Falkland, I think it was the Spanish, and it went on over a number of years until 1833 when the British sort of came back in and sort of took possession in a forceful way, if you like, and, and kicked the Spanish out. And then this is, it's on this date that the Argentinians based their territorial claim. Uh, and as I say, I'm not going to get into the rights and wrongs or taking sides on that. We'll just talk about what happened in 1982. So, um, what I should tell you about, that we haven't discussed prior, is the sort of lead-up to the war, without going into detail, because I've, I've been listening to some fascinating data, uh, especially in Max Hastings' book, The Battle for the Falklands, which I strongly recommend you read, or I'll listen to it on the audio book. It's a fantastic piece of work, I've got to tell you. Uh, he goes into all the detail, it seems very unbiased, you know, it's very factual, all about Argentina's claim and what Britain claimed and blah blah blah. And then what happened in the 60s and 70s leading, leading up to the, uh, the invasion by Argentina on the 2nd of April 1982. Um, but I would just say that there was, um, there was a lot of confusion um, in terms of the politics behind this. Uh, and I'm talking about the politics, especially in Britain actually. Argentina seem to use this sometimes as a bit of a morale boosting uh, venture I think uh, you know rightly or wrongly they, they believe that they have a, right, a rightful claim to the islands and the British believe that they have a rightful claim and of course the islanders want to remain British I think with one exception I think he's left and gone to Argentina some time ago but anyway back on the British side there was a lot of a lot of mistakes were made, not just during the conflict, but actually well before the conflict. A lot of um, diplomatic mistakes, political mistakes, and I'm not knocking Britain about this. I'm not a Britain bash, I can assure you. But some very interesting things. I've got a few facts that I just I jotted down to remind me. And one of the things was the Foreign Office. The Foreign Office were in the 70s especially. There was lots of meetings where there was UN meetings with Argentina and the Brits getting around the table and having discussions without including the Falkland Islanders in these discussions and sometimes without inf including the knowledge of the government or the Foreign Secretary even when it was uh, the prior Foreign Secretaries. I won't go into all the history because it's very long but there is, it's almost like the Foreign Office were gone rogue and I think they do this sometimes on a lot of issues. Uh, some of these government departments in the British government, uh, irrespective of your political persuasions or who you vote for, I can tell you that it doesn't matter they're like a little law unto themselves from these departments, it seems to me, that they just go off and start, sort of, have these white or mandarins who think that they are, you know, empowered to do what they think. And, uh, and this is what was happening in the 70s. And there was an element in the 70s where um, there was an agenda, I think, from the Foreign Office that were p pushing... Uh, perhaps it was considered that the Falkland Islands commitment, which was a lot less then, we had HMS Endurance of course, the ship, but it was a costly uh, venture, you know, to have these ships and we had some marines down there of course that were permanently stationed on the island, only about 30 of them. And again, South Georgia, we had a couple of marines there as well, I think. But um, the Foreign Office obviously, obviously took it upon themselves to decide that this was rather expensive and they started having these negotiations that they kept on they kept on getting to this point where 
if if a politician and even the Labour Party um, were really doing the right thing as well as the Conservative Party in the seventies, in the it would always get to the same point in negotiations where they'd say, well. The Falkland Islanders, as soon as you consult the Falkland Islanders, they would say no, you know, that they didn't want to become Argentinian, rightly or wrongly. And, and it, was, it was just that the Foreign Office kept reintroducing, restarting negotiations. And this is where I think some of the problems began, especially when they, uh, they had the military takeover in Argentina in the late 70s. Uh, and then they had this military junta came in uh, under Galtieri in 81. Um, an expectation was being created and it was given an impression, I think, to Argentina that this was either supported by the British government or indeed the British people, that they wanted to eventually... There was talk of having a Hong Kong-style arrangement where they'd lease the islands back. They'd, they'd maybe give sovereignty to Argentina and then lease them back for 100 years, like they with Hong Kong and China. Um, but this was never going to happen and every single time um, the inhabitants were consulted, there was a very clear... No, we want to remain British. And, and the only people who were pushing this agenda in the UK was the Foreign Office, it seems. And then you had subsequent uh, ministers, including on the Conservatives when they came in in 1979, you had Nicholas Ridley, who ended up caught in the middle a little bit because he got the Islanders on one side and he got the Foreign Office on the other and he was like, <laughs> piggy in the middle. Anyway, we won't get into all the diplomacy and the things that went on because it's, it's a long story and it can create emotions we don't want to revive on both sides. Let's talk about, though, the next step. I talked about um, the Falklands we talked about in relation to these models. I talked about the Sea Wolf and Sea Dart and the, uh, the defence of the fleet um, in my um, first ep episode one of the Falklands War. Episode two, we talked about the Sea Harrier. Um, and in this episode, and we talked about the Invincible, of course, as well. Um, and in this episode, I want to talk about the sort of land war without going into huge detail, because this is probably the one part of the war where... Most of us who weren't there, and I'm one of them, obviously I was only a lad. Um, we didn't have that much information, if we're honest. Um, we did get reports after the event. Um, unlike Argentina, of course, who got a report about the attack on Goose Green, they got a report from the BBC that it was about to occur, which was the most stupid thing ever. So typical. No wonder Mrs Thatcher, the British Prime Minister, was so cross with them. They actually announced the day before they were going to attack Goose, Goose Green. Quite... I actually thought it was strange at the time, you had Brian Hanrahan, who I've got a lot of respect for, the late Brian Hanrahan, a good, good journalist, I thought he was. And he, he gave a very sort of balanced and calm and sensible, you know, sober report. Um, and yet you had these other people, and I think it was Laurie Margolis, was the one that let the cat out of the bag, and there was a chap called Black as well. Um, is it Robert Black? I may be wrong on that one, so don't shoot me down. But um, one or two of these journalists were... Um, trying to get a scoop all the time. Now, you don't do that in the middle of a war. That's absolutely a no-no, especially if you are <laughs> the broadcasting corporation of one side of the argument. And apparently the BBC actually said, when they were criticised by the government, they actually told their journalists, we are the BBC, we are not Britain, which I find a very strange comment. Um, maybe some of you will probably shake your heads and think well, it's not that strange given the way that they've gone recently. But anyway, again, I'm not trying to bash the BBC. I'm quoting what was said at the time. There's plenty of evidence to these. Everything I've just told you I've read recently in the last day or two. <laughs> um, but that is an astonishing thing to have said. Um, and, of course, they, there was almost... Uh, I think they had gagging orders put on, and there was delays about what they could report, and they had to delay it uh, by about 48 hours from then on in. But anyway, getting back to the actual the land war. So, on... 21st of May, um, we, the, we were finally, the British, sorry, we, I wasn't there, I was, I was at school, but the British were finally able to find an appropriate landing point and they landed at San Carlos Water. Now, this is on the extreme west end of East Falkland Island and a long way from Port Stanley. Um, obviously, the Argentines had, uh, they had various um, sort of posts and um, bases they'd set up. One was on uh, Pebble Island, which the SAS uh, went up there and knocked out the Pukara aircraft in a, a very typical SAS strike uh, in the dead of night. Um, totally successful without any casualties on that occasion. And then um, they were also involved in doing all sorts of other, um, and the SBS uh, and the commandos and the parachutes were doing all sorts of little raids here and there. 
but the main landing was at San Carlos Water, which is uh, became known as Bum Alley, as we've talked about before, with all these uh, uh, the Argentine Air Force, who, of course, I think it's widely accepted they probably acquitted themselves as the most impressive of Argentina's forces in the Falklands War. Incredibly courageous. Um, there were some issues with their aircraft and there were some issues with their tactics, which didn't help them. Um, but they did quite a bit of damage. Uh, they sank the Sheffield, obviously, they sank Coventry, uh, the Arden, which snapped in two, uh, broadsaws, badly damaged, um, my memory's going, uh, there's, uh, there's ones I'm missing, on, obvious ones, um, the Atlantic conveyor, of course, which was uh, carrying um, more heli the helicopters, and this is, this is going to be the crux of what I'm going to talk about anyway. Atlantic conveyor went down, it had, I think, two Chinooks and about four or five Sea Kings on it. Now these were, the Chinooks especially, were vital for carrying the troops. The idea was, after the landings at San Carlos, they were going to transport our British troops over land and then drop them at the appropriate points where they'd need to commence battle with the Argentinians. So obviously Tumble Down and uh, Mount Longdon and places like this. Mount Kent. Um, and. and when the Atlantic conveyor was sold, which was at a very critical time, I think that was on the 25th, so that was four days later, the 25th, just at the time that they were about to come in and unload it, um, it was it was sunk, and, and sadly its captain, who was a, uh, he wasn't a member of the Navy, he was the, um, basically a, a, a civilian sailor, essentially, um, but he uh, was a very, far, very, very popular man, I have to say, from what I've read. Uh, a typical sailor with a big bushy beard, uh, very got on very well with all the people on the ship, uh, very well liked by his crew, and uh, when the ship uh, was hit by these two exocets, which basically went through the same hole, incredibly, pretty much, creating one bigger hole, uh, of course the ship set on fire. Don't think the Exocets actually exploded. There's been a lot of debate on this. When you look at the damage to that ship, I don't think the Exocets exploded because had they exploded, they would have blown the back of the ship off, and they, that didn't happen. It just fire, fire was the problem. So, and th this was a, a common theme which I mentioned about the Argentine Air Force. Um, no criticism, but a lot of their bombs and missiles did not actually detonate. Um, quite a lot didn't, uh, and they, were, they said that in the case of the bombs with the Skyhawks, they were they're actually too brave their pilots they were coming in too low and it didn't give the bombs a chance to actually arm and so they didn't detonate and they went through HMS Glasgow the bomb went straight through the ship and out the other side incredibly obviously it caused a lot of damage and some people I think a couple of guys were killed or a lot of wounds because it's not a nice place to be obviously um, and, but of course with the Exocets um, Allegedly, the Exocet that hit the Sheffield, uh, again, there's a debate about this, whether it did or did not detonate. And again, I get the impression from the, looking at all the photographs and studying all the uh, reports, uh, even, the scene, even the captain couldn't be absolutely sure whether it detonated. I don't think it did detonate, because it had blown the Sheffield hut in half, frankly, and it, it was, again, it was fire. So, and that certainly seems to be what happened on the Atlantic conveyor. So there's a common theme with these Exocets. They don't seem to be detonated on impact, all of them. And as a result of that, they, but the rocket motor is just, it just sets fire to everything, you know, and there's any am ammunition or fuel anywhere, and there's lots of ammo and fuel on these ships at the time, and then you end up with a horrendous fire, and uh, yeah, very nasty. And I say, Ian North, I'm going back to the Atlantic Conveyor, this transport ship, Ian North uh, perished in the water, sadly, and they're trying to rescue him, hanging on for uh, helicopters were coming in trying to rescue them out of the water. And this was north, and I'll show you in a minute, in this book, there's this, this book I've got here, well, is, is unique in my experience of books on the Falklands. It actually shows you where each one of these ships was sunk, which I haven't seen before, not in that detail. Um, it's not a particularly special map, but it's just the fact that it shows them all. Anyway, suddenly the say, say Ian North went down, uh, he was the, pretty much the last man off his ship, like a true captain, and sadly perished in the water and was never found, sadly. It's a very sad story, you know, as a civilian. But anyway, there we go. Um, coming back to the, the sort of what happened next. Once um, all these ships had deposited the uh, the troops at Ajax Bay and, and surrounding uh, the surrounding bays on uh, San Carlos Water, 
Then what they needed to do was get all their supplies up because it's, it's all very well depositing a thousand or two troops. They can't, you know, they're on the wrong end of an island. It's like marching across the size of Wales almost, this island. Uh, certainly the size of North Wales. You can't just expect them, you know. They have no, they didn't have any tanks apart from the Scorpion, which we have here, so I'll just zoom you in on. Uh, but again, it takes time to get the logistics right to actually get these vehicles out. There weren't that many of these Scorpions anyway. There was only about, uh, I think about 10 or 12 maybe? Uh, not a lot, because, you know, the... the they didn't have the carrying capacity, and there was no, you know, big, heavy main battle tanks. Some scorpions and some scimitars, obviously Land Rovers, things like that. But we were very limited in what we had in terms of, excuse me, transport. Transport was key. Falklands is a pretty unpleasant, in, barren and inhospitable land. Um, and the Argentinians obviously found this too, but they had uh, they had helicopters, so they'd use helicopters in the way that we intended to. They even had the same helicopters, they had pumas, of which, um, I don't think we had any pumas, or not many pumas in the Falklands, but they did, they had quite a few of them. Uh, there's quite a few stories about them. <laughs> Dave Morgan actually destroyed a puma helicopter, he's a sea harrier pilot. Um, you read his book, Hostile Skies, he tells you all about this. And he actually... Um, I think his colleague shot one down, he shot one down, and then he actually shot another one down without shooting it by his draft from his jet. He went into a very extraordinary steep dive and then pulled up. I think he was out of ammo. He pulled up next, to the, very close to this puma, and his draft was so great it blew it into the mountain. It exploded. <laughs> Shouldn't laugh, obviously. It's not, it's not funny, but remarkable. Very unusual. And it just shows you the power of a fast jet. You know, and the helicopters are a little bit... They're whirly birds, aren't they? They're a bit delicate, really. Anyway, getting back to the situation. So, you then get all these uh, troops on the island. You've, you've got the flag led by Rear Admiral Sir Sandy Woodward. Uh, and there are numerous stories about about him and uh, some of the, the ways he went about um, commanding his men. Um, which didn't always seem to be, from what I've read, and again, I wasn't there, and I don't know the man. I didn't know the man. But there's a lot of controversy around him, and there's a lot of controversy around Sharky Ward, of course, who I've talked about before, uh, the famous Sea Harrier pilot uh, from Invincible. But um, anyway, um, there was pressure coming from him um, because we, we, we then had these landings. There's lots of risk where, you know, every time one of his ships went into San Carlos water, including the uh, um, the Canberra, with the, with the big cruise ship, of course, which had the commandos on it, uh, I think they had the commandos and I think the Welsh guards were on there as well. Um, and then, you know, this thing would be sitting there, this, they used to call it the White Whale because it was such a big white ship and it looked like a sitting target, you know. How it wasn't hit is just a, a miracle, really. Um, but he was very... I can understand that the Admiral was worried because he had all these ships and they're getting hit like the Ardent going down in the sound there. Very vulnerable to attack from the Argentine Air Force and he wanted to get them out as quickly as possible. And once he deposited all these troops, they didn't really move very far. They sort of took up a bridgehead defensive positions around San Carlos water and then moved into the mountains nearby, but didn't really break out and make an advance. Now, there's a lot of criticism at the time, and I, I do remember, um, not so much in the papers, but there's this general feeling that nothing was happening. We'd gone from landing, you know, and everybody thought it was going to be like D-Day, and then all of a sudden it went very quiet, and all you heard about was these Argentine Air Force attacks every day, taking out one ship after another, you know, Coventry, Antelope, Antelope of course got hit, and uh, the bomb finally went off many, many hours later in the, in the magazine in the middle of the night, and that's, that doomed the Antelope, and she sank it for And there's that famous picture of her, with, like, illuminated this huge explosion in the middle of the night. Horrendous. Um, and obviously, you know, this was happening that every day that those ships were around, there was more and more danger. So uh, there was there was frustration built up, and and frustration was also building up politically in London with the government. You know, Mrs. Thatcher and the the chiefs of staff were getting very impatient, and there was no apparent progress towards taking the islands back. And so, um, allegedly, this is the way that the story is told. Perhaps a little bit precipitously, they decided to attack Goose Green. Now, Goose Green is this um, rather remarkable little uh, sort of village on this isthmus, this little land bridge 
between the sort of western side of north and south of East Falkland, if you know what I mean. I'll show you the map in a minute. Um, now, the Argentines had, a, had a, quite a big garrison there, and they'd taken over control of Darwin and, and Goose Green, and that enabled them to control, you know, any shipping that came that way and shoot out at sea, and, and they were a threat, no doubt about it. But whether they actually merited a full-on attack by the 2nd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, uh, and I think the Commandos and the Gurkha Rifles went in as well, whether it really merited that, there's a lot of debate about this, and I'm not, I'm not questioning. I wasn't there. I just want to. I'm relaying to you what I've read. Uh, I've read and heard lots and lots of stuff, and there is a feeling that this was perhaps a, a unwise and b premature. I think that's the biggest problem. And they went in, perhaps not with the amount of force that they needed to. They didn't have the air support they needed to at that moment, um, and. Of course, in the end, um, we had about, I think there was a total of 600 troops the Brits sent in against a force of about 1,400 Argentinian soldiers, some of whom were, were some of their Marines who were actually quite experienced, not, not in terms of war, but were highly trained, let's say, highly trained troops, and, uh, and, and showed that because they actually did command respect, they were actually put up a good defence um, and what ultimately happened was uh, they had to, the, the Paris had to fight their way um, with limited artillery support, limited air support, just not enough of anything really, apart from courage. Um, they always say that they are the toughest fighting troops in the world and I know that any of you that have been in the commandos or you know, the Welsh Guards, the Scots Guards, etc. You will disagree, I'm sure. But that's what they said. And they, in the end, they, they fought up to Darwin. And this is where their uh, commanding officer, Colonel H, Lieutenant Colonel H Jones, Herbert Jones, was killed. Um, himself, personally charging a machine gun nest with two of the guys. Um, because they were, they were worried about, they were running out of time. And, uh, they were worried about running low on ammo. They didn't want to get pinned down. And he maybe was a little bit rash, but this guy, everything I've read about this guy, really epitomises a true leader, you know, a, a guy who leads from the front, which is exactly what he did. Uh, and sadly he was shot, I think he was hit in the, uh, in the throat, I think, and I think he had a torso wound. And he, he died quite quickly, sadly, after being hit, despite um, his colleagues rushing to him to give him first aid. It, it, it wasn't, wasn't enough. And of course he was awarded the Victoria Cross for his action. Um, and Chris Keeble, the guy that took over from him, um, he was really, that they just lost their commanding officer. This, this put them in a really serious position. And he actually was very, very clever. Again, I've read criticism, criticism of him, and I won't go into it. There's always two sides, you know, there's always criticism. And you've got to sort of take some of this stuff in the round and never jump on the criticism, never jump on the mistakes, because you weren't there, I wasn't there. And you've got to imagine how horrific these conditions are. It's bloody freezing cold, you know. The Argentinians have got the same problems. They're low on rations and supplies. They're all hungry and, you know, and it's very frightening, you know, to be fighting, fighting a war in this wintry, bleak place. Um, none of you've got enough food. None of you've got enough shelter. I mean, the, uh, the paratroopers had limited sort of tents and things, you know. They, didn't, they were very cold. And, and they didn't have the support they needed, and it was very tough. So this guy, Chris Keeble, decided to try to find a way to call the Argentinians bluff uh, and get them to surrender even. And he didn't know the numbers, and neither side knew the numbers at the time, but he was outnumbered more than two to one, uh, like two and a half to one. And what he did was he actually managed the next day to call in a Harrier um, GR3 Harrier strike, um, with um, mattress snare rockets and uh, cluster bombs and they came in and took out the Argentinian air defence um, guns and cluster bombed where the Argentinian garrison were. Um, now they were all in trenches and they didn't, I don't think they killed uh, many people but a few were killed I think. But this put it just had a terror shock and awe effect and it, it put terror straight to the Argentinians on the spot, which it would do with anybody, you know, there's no disgrace to them at all. And the commanding officer, yes, he said to the commanding officer, you must surrender, um, you can come out with honour, 
you know, you've put up a fantastic fight, but you must surrender. Otherwise, I'll call in multiple airstrikes and just obliterate Goose Green. <laughs> which she never intended to do. But and and the Argentine officer very sensibly said, "I accept that, but my men want to come out and form a they call it a hollow square where they they, they stand in there." Uh, sort of regimental um, parade style, and they don't, and then they then they give the weapons up, but they don't just come out with the hands up or anything like that. And this is agreed, and this is the photograph, the famous photo you saw, where they got all the helmets on the ground, hundreds of them, literally hundreds and hundreds of helmets and, and weapons and guns on the floor. But it, it was not necessarily, you know, ne it wasn't really necessary to fight this because they lost a lot of guys, a lot, of, some of their best men. Um, I suppose you can argue when you look at the map that they could have been outflanked if they hadn't done this. The Argentinians could have outflanked them from Grew Screen and come up behind them when they were pushing forward, advancing to Stanley. Anyway, then you get the main advance, and then you, you still require in that position that the the British were in. They required these helicopters, which were gone, you know. So they they then had on the Atlantic conveyor. They they no longer had any means to get forward. Apart from walking, and this is when the famous phrase of yomping comes in, and you see this famous <laughs> photograph where the guy's got the flag on his radio aerial, Union flag, and they have to walk right across the island. Now, from what I've read, I, it, it makes me shudder when I've read some of these accounts, because these guys didn't have any tents, they were sleeping in the open. It was minus five, minus ten degrees, it was horrendous conditions, it was blowing the most ferocious wind, and it was wet, it was going into the winter, it was not, and they had frostbite, lots of them had frostbite, some of them were getting gangrene, um, what, I read one account where they had um, uh, what do you call it, a naval uh, corporation, uh, sorry, a Royal Air Force Corporation officer, one of the guys who had arranged these strikes with the Harriers, and he was yomping and he, he couldn't take it, like an ordinary person wouldn't. He was never trained to do that, you know. And he would, he'd already acquitted himself very well, but he, he really suffered with his feet. And it was, it was like World War One almost, you know, but with lots of walking. It was horrendous for them to go through these conditions night after night and then come under fire. And these guys weren't getting any sleep, you know. They were tired, they weren't getting enough to eat. It was terrible, it was terrible. And so what they decided to do was reinforce them by bringing in the Welsh Guards, and they were going to come round under Stanley to Fitzroy and um, Bluff Cove, and we all know what happens next. Um, there were some uh, terrible mistakes were made in terms of timing. Instead of coming in landing craft, they decided to bring the big transport ships, Sir Galahad and Sir Tristram, and bring them right up into Fitzroy. And they did it in daylight, and this is what went wrong, really. Uh, and this is one thing where you think, well... Even without the hindsight that you and I have got today, you wouldn't do that, would you? You wouldn't put them in that, that peril. The Argentine Air Force were not defeated. The one thing the Brits did not succeed in was getting air superiority. And that was through no fault of our own, you know, really. It was just impossible to let your carriers get too close to the Argentine Air Force. So they, they were always operating at range. They, they had the same problems the Argentinian Air Force did, really. So it's very difficult, very difficult. Um, and of course, because they were still, you know, starting to unload these ships, instead of doing it in the middle of the night, they were doing it on a, you know, middle of the morning. And in came the Argentine Air Force just before lunch, and uh, and the Skyhawks bombed both, hit, hit, got hits on both these carrier uh, ships, full of ammo, full of men. This is the Sir Galahad was a ship that Simon Weston, the famous uh, chap who had lost his face with. Horrible burns, and they had to graft skin, you know. And he, he suffered all his life. He's been such a a hero and a ambassador for these guys, these Welsh guards, um, and a very, very perfect example of courage, you know, lifelong courage. It's uh, he didn't let this destroy him in the way that many of us would have, I think. Um, but they they suffered horribly. They were burned. These guys. Some of them were down in the hold and never even got out. They were basically incinerated. And he talked about, Simon Weston talked about feeling like they'd been hit by nap arm because everything was on fire, you know, everything. Fuel went to uh, Horrendous, horrendous. And then there's these famous pictures where they're trying to get these wounded men back to shore or uh, Bluff Cove. Very, very unpleasant. <clears throat> so the Welsh Guards as a fighting force were effectively almost completely knocked out. So that didn't help. Um, and, and so the Paris and the Commandos and the Scots, uh, Scots Guards 
um, they had to march across and take out these Argentinians, sort of one one emplacement at a time, you know, Mount Kent, Mount London, two sisters, tumble down, if it's horrendous, all the way to Stanley. Um, and they did it, the fact that they did it, you know, they, they had... Uh, they had great artillery. I think that was one thing that helped them a lot. Um, our artillery was very, very good, but it was very bloody, you know. And these guys are. Uh, I was reading an account that was um, Mount Longdon, and it's absolutely horrendous battle that was. Absolutely horrendous. Um, fighting hand to hand with bayonets, they're running low amount ammo. They were bayonet using bayonet fighting in the end. It was really, really bad, you know. And the Argentinians, you know, to their credit, put up a good resistance and were actually uh, quite a force to be reckoned with, uh, especially in Longdon and Mount Tumbledown. And then, of course, at the end, uh, ultimately, um, once those peaks had been captured, um, then the game was really over and, and the Argentinian forces in Stanley were kind of surrounded and then ultimately surrendered. Um, and Menendez, he, um, Mendez, he surrendered because he didn't want to, he knew that Stanley was just full of wooden houses and that if they fought in the streets, it, everything would just burn, everything would be burned to the ground. And he knew that he would, that they'd get slaughtered, so he, he very sensibly uh, didn't do that. Um, Sandy Woodward, apparently, after the surrender was all signed with Gillian Thompson, um, Sorry, it was um, Jeremy Moore, Jeremy Moore, not Jenny Thompson. Jenny Thompson was in charge of the commandos, wasn't he? I'm sure some of you that were there will shout out and tell when I'm wrong. I'm trying to do this from memory, OK? Um, Jeremy Moore uh, got the surrender signed and uh, the Admiral, Sir Sandy Woodward, he, Rear Admiral Sandy Woodward, as he was then, he refused to meet Men Mendez and he wouldn't shake his hand and meet him because he said that he should have surrendered. Once they basically surrounded those mountains, they should have surrendered. A lot of Brits died, a lot of his sailors died, and he was quite bitter about it, you know. But I guess that's war, you know. Uh, I think that the other problem for the Argentinians was the, the way they went about it. Individuals were very brave, but the organisation was just very poor. Mendez, I don't think he really knew what he was doing. I'm not sure I couldn't have organised it better than he did, to be honest. You, you study some of the, the way he went about it. And there was a lot of cruelty um, on the Argentine side toward their own soldiers. They were, they were coming down from the mountains. Some of them, they, had, they just were left up there on these mountain peaks. And they had no supplies, no food. They were running out of rations. Some of them came down to get food and were caught and were punished. They actually staked men out on the ground, face down, for a, a whole day in some cases, in the bitter freezing cold. You know, the British army wouldn't do that. You'd be punished, but you wouldn't be tortured, you know. And this, this I'm afraid, was the style of the Argentinian military at the time, so that didn't help them. So I think that those troops that were able to surrender, I think, were quite pleased because the British treated them correctly. But they left a terrible mess behind them in Stanley, you know. There's lot, even Prince Andrew talked about this. Um, don't want to get into him, especially now, but uh, he was a witness that said when he, he landed his helicopter, the, the, the mess that was strewn everywhere, that devastated the place, you know. Uh, I mean, I won't go into all the details that I read, because some of the accounts of the mess they left behind was disgusting, really. Um, they didn't treat uh, the property of the Falklanders very well. Um, and they were soon repatriated to, to Argentina, but there we go, that was the end of the war, uh, and then, was it 14th of June, I think it was? So there we have it, that's the Falklands War encapsulated for you. Um, I think it, it's very hard to over-exaggerate how tough it was for these guys that had to walk across the armour. That must have been absolute hell in those conditions. If it had been in summer, that would have been one thing, but not in the winter as it was, it was just awful, really. And they endured a lot of tough things. Anyway, we're going to get into, we're not going to go into the models because we've seen those before. But I thought we'd have a look at some of these items here. So I'm going to rearrange and you can have a quick look. And we will... Scorpion over there a little bit. <laughs> Let's have a look at this. This is an interesting book I can recommend to you. Christopher Chance, Air War in the Falklands, which has just arrived with me a few days ago. I wanted something that was specific to the Air War in the Falklands, and here it is. And the thing that impressed me the most as soon as I opened this book, really, was on this first page. And this is this map I mentioned to you. I'm going to zoom you right in for this. Look at this map. Now then, it shows the positions of all the sinkings and all the critical uh, battles. 
So the Coventry was sunk off Pebble Island, which I didn't know. I thought it was in San Carlos. Atlantic Conveyor was due north of East Falkland here. Then we've got, I'll zoom in a bit more for this. Then we've got the Falkland Sound Battle I've just been talking about. San Carlos, sorry, San Carlos Water I should say. HMS Antelope, right there in San Carlos Water. HMS Ardent was actually off the main... Uh, off the main island, it wasn't in San Carlos water, it was in Falkland Sound itself and that broke in two. And then you've got Port San Carlos and San Carlos, you've got the Fitzroy settlement, so here we've got Sir Galahad, get a bit closer. Here, um, Sir Galahad, uh, Sir Tristram, isn't actually shown there, so I don't know if Sir Tristram was recovered in fact. And then down here of course, you've got right, right down at the bottom, HMS Sheffield. So that's quite a useful uh, map to have, which I didn't know those relative positions. I knew, I think the only one I knew really was Sheffield and Antelope. The rest I, I didn't really know where they were. So that really puts it in perspective for you, then it shows you, you know, uh, tumble down. Top Marlow House, this is in the middle of nowhere here. That's, that's a worth a little mention. Uh, there was a real old kickoff there. There's a History Channel documentary about this. In fact I've been watching some very good documentaries I'm going to include them uh, a link underneath the description for this video because I think you'll find them very good. Now there's one and any Argentinians watching this uh, don't, don't, don't shoot the message you guys yet but any Argentinians watching this there's one that's called The Falklands War from the British Perspective. Well I can tell you that that, that was the stupidest title I ever saw because this particular video and I've seen lots I have seen a lot now this is excellent, this one. And it isn't from the British perspective. It's from everybody's perspective. It interviews a lot of Argentine soldiers on the ground, pilots uh, from the Argentine Navy and the Marines. It was really interesting. I thought this is... It's in three parts. So I'll include the first part. I would, whether you're British or Argentine, I, I strongly commend it to you. And it's one of these documentaries that's not done in the modern style, which can be a bit... I don't know about you, but I watch some of these things on TV and it's all this thing where they have an, an, a commercial break and then they have to recap everything and then they recap it after the commercial break. It drives me crazy. This is a much more calm, factual, sober, uh, a very thorough sort of uh, assessment with, with lots of eyewitness accounts on all sides, civilians, you know, the guys who are in the Royal Naval Air Service flying the Harriers, um, the Air Armada and the Marines of the Argentine Navy. Everybody's in this in this video. It's really well done. Uh, I recommend that one too. Anyway, getting back to the book. I'll zoom in a bit more for this. Uh, yeah, there's some, there's some very interesting stuff in here and we will have a quick flip through it now. Um, showing you all the preparations. I'll zoom in and go this one. All the preps. Explaining the background of the Argentine Air Force what the forces were that they were able to bring to the island and you've got some nice colour plates with Harriers, Vulcan, Victors, Sea Harrier, Chinook and then we go on to the Argentines with their um, Escudrilla de Ataque, Commando de la Aviación Naval Argentina, Argentina, the Aramaki MP339As, Super 8 on Dars, it's Skyhawks and then of course the Bucaras and the uh, Mirage 3 um, and then the various support aircraft, the Canberra bomber which they brought from the UK Lynx they brought from the UK Is there a Puma here? Can she have a Puma? Can she have a Puma? That's interesting, there's a lot of Pumas and the Daggers which they sort of don't show in the same way there but then we've got lots of really good photographs uh, you've got Coventry going down, you've got the cluster bombs British Wessex and Chinooks, and you've got your Pukaras. Um, there's the Atlantic conveyor with the Sea Harrier on it. Now, something I should mention, just remember, reminded me talking about that, that I meant to mention earlier. Here's an interesting fact that I've only just learned, which is truly amazing. So, on the Atlantic conveyor, and there may be a photo here, let me just find the other photo. I'm sure there's one which shows all the planes stacked along the deck. There it is. Now look at this photo. Now what happened? Oops. The zoom to work. Not have a chance. Um, what they did, um, because they were going to be on sitting on the deck behind a few containers, 
the Harriers, GR3s in the foreground and C Harriers in the background there, toward the bow. See how they wrap them? They wrap them in uh, protective plastic and taped, all taped it up. Obviously to protect it from the effects of the sea. Now there's a very good reason for this. Um, the <laughs> this is this is amazing. I still can't pinch myself when I tell this story. So basically, the GR three Harriers they came from Germany. You know, brought in from Germany, from Guttersloe and uh, Wildenrath and places like that. Um, and they were never intended to go to sea. They were never intended to be in the sea air. So they protected them, um, and they also protected. But they started also wrapping the sea Harriers that were on the Atlantic conveyor as well, because it was several weeks, four or five weeks. Let's say four. Um, unlike on the Invincible, where they can put them in, in the hangar below decks when the weather's bad. Well, they couldn't do that on the Atlantic conveyor, obviously. Now, when they actually unloaded these, now, luckily, of course, the, these Harrier jets were not destroyed on the Atlantic conveyor. Luckily, they'd been unloaded about 10 days prior. As soon as they got within range of the task force, they basically unwrapped them. Pilots came via helicopters and then took off vertically and went to the Invincible and went to the Hermes. So they were away and luckily were not hit when the Atlantic conveyor was sunk. But something to start, when they were doing initial training exercises, especially when the, the first Harriers arrived um, on Hermes, G, sorry, the GR3 Harriers, I mean the RAF Harriers, they noticed something very strange because they were noticing that uh, when they, the, the, the GR3 Harriers seemed to be giving a much smaller radar signature than the Sea Harriers were. And they couldn't figure out why that would be, because it's the same aircraft, give or take a bulge here or two, you know, same plane. Effectively, as far as radar is concerned, it's the same plane, same signature, same size, everything dimensions are pretty much the same. Anyway, um, what they started to do was they, they got the Sea Harriers flying, they were doing training just before they started the attacks of places like Goose Green. And they had Sea Harriers and the Harriers GR3s flying together. And you could see a noticeable difference in the radar signature. The Sea Harriers were giving a radar signature that was about 50, well, I think they said two to three times the size of, a, of the regular Harriers, the RAF Harriers. And they thought this was mighty strange. Um, so, once they were on the ship, um, after a week or so, this, this, this changed and they started to give the same. And then they started investigating, well, hang on a minute, oh, this is ridiculous. Why are they giving a different radar signature? And then they realised that <laughs> the guys uh, on the Hermes had actually taken, because they, because they were very worried, the RAF guys I'm talking about, and their support crew, they were genuinely noticing starts of corrosion. And there is um, some photographs where you can see some sort of yellowing browning on the finish on these RAF Harriers. And it, it starts very rapidly as soon as it gets exposed to the salty air. So, what the RAF guys did was they actually sprayed them, these Harriers, with WD-40. They got tons and tons of WD-40 and they were literally going around spraying it and wiping it down. For you know, a very logical reason to give it some protection from the salty air. But unfortunately, when they did... <laughs> When they did this, it, it, it amplified the radar signature of the actual aircraft. And it, and it made the Harry GR3s then look like they were a huge aircraft as well. And they all became the same. Um, now, there, there is another version of this I read where they said that actually the Sea Harrier was, had a lot, of, um, a lot more uh, magnesium, I think they said. I've got this right. They got a lot more magnesium. They had anti-corrosion products. Um, some of the aluminium and the magnesium was designed for sea use and it wasn't on the regular Harriers it was like more lightweight aluminium etc and it made it much more prone to this corrosion so they sprayed it with W40 and then they actually doubled their problems because they made the thing of this huge they actually said it was almost as big on the, on the radar it was nearly as big as a Vulcan <laughs> so they realised eventually and they started to um, try, I think they found another um, product they could use as a, an inhibitor but, um, but these, these Harriers, especially the GR3, they didn't fare very well in this climate. It wasn't really uh, at sea. The sea air was doing them no favours at all. But what a remarkable story. Anyway, um, back to the book, back to the book. 
was just so I just remember because I saw a note about it and I thought I was about to finish. Let's get back to this amazing book. Here we've got, um, well you can see actually exactly what I've just been talking about, the Sea Harrier and the GR3 patrolling together a lot when they were doing practice runs etc. Now I've not had a chance to read all this book so I don't know whether it mentions this story about the WD-40 but it's quite interesting isn't it, it really is quite revealing. Then we've got the, uh, the GR3s that are not used to going off the ramp, practicing on the Hermes deck. The dominance of the Sea Harrier, here we go. And we've got here the, the daggers being prepared with their, their missiles and tanks going on. Mirage 3A, and this is the one they call the dagger, isn't it? I was getting a little confused which is the dagger, I'll be honest. Mirage and dagger in the Falklands, here we go. Oh yeah, the dagger's got the different nose, hasn't it? Here we go, this is the dagger. <clears throat> there we are. Yeah, it's got that different profile to the nose. It's longer. The different radar system, doesn't it? And then you've got the Argentines on the 25th of May. In de Senco de Mayo, which of course scuttled, we all know that scuttled back to port, uh, understandably perhaps. Um, once the HMS Conqueror had sank the uh, General Belgrano, the uh, ARA General Belgrano, which was a, a medium cruiser. By the way, it was hit from the HMS Conqueror, it was hit by, they, they launched three um, high explosive torpedoes at it. The first one, hit the right at the bow and blew the bow off and if you look at the photographs of it sinking you see that the bow is gone it's sort of clipped away and broken down so the first one hit the bow the second one hit the stern and the third one missed and of course what a controversial incident um and you've got pictures here of uh, you've actually got one of the harriers taking off as i described from the atlantic conveyor here which is quite quite good look at that there we are going off on the deck Luckily, just in time before the Exocet arrive. HMS Sheffield is in a bad way, as you can see there. And then we've got some more of these uh, shots of the um, Super 8 on darts, which of course were very, very dangerous. Probably the most lethal with the Exocet here it is. Quite easily the most lethal thing that the Argentines had to offer. Um, very, very uh, worrying times. Uh, it's, it's a good thing they didn't have a a big supply of these missiles because I think we'd have been in terrible problems. Uh, the British would have been, uh, if they'd have lost one of the ships, they would have been game over really. There's the Harrier GR3s rusting a bit, I think. <laughs> Does it say anything about the rust? No. We've got various action shots. Here's the dagger in uh, San Carlos water, 21st of May. All the action is taking place, and this is the ant, uh, this is the, sorry, the. That's actually the, 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 I can tell you there's an error here, it says it's the antelope, it's not the antelope. But I'm pretty sure that that is the Arden, which is the one that broke in two. It shows it as the antelope, it's not, it's not what's wrong. Um, then you've got all the, uh, the gazelles, lynx, the rapier system. It's a great book, it's all in here. British air, super, British overall air superiority. Yeah, Atlantic conveyor. Sir Galahad in a bad way there. Terrible. The whole thing was just a big inferno, really. Mm. And then we've got the 9L Sidewinder missiles being loaded. Chinooks. This is a thing we just needed so much of and didn't have them in the end. They were denied to us. Yeah, it's a very good book. It's a very good book. Um, I really think that if you're interested in this subject, you really get a benefit from this. But let's have a look at the magazine. This is something that's just come out a few weeks ago. So this is the Aeroplane uh, monthly magazine. I won't go right through it, but we'll focus on this Falklands uh, element where they've got a Falklands 40th. Here we go. Commemorating the 1982 war in the South Atlantic. Classic shot of the Harry going up the ramp there on Hermes. The Vulcan, 
and all the preparation, uh, Ascension Island, getting all the Vulcans ready. And of course we've got Martin with us. <laughs> Martin with us when he had hair. <laughs> okay, he's a hero, wasn't he? That was no mean feat what they achieved there. And then they got the Martel anti-radiation missile. Martel? I didn't know Martel was an anti-radiation missile. That doesn't look like a Martel to me. Isn't that Shrike? I think it's Shrike. I think that's an error. Those of you that know better than I, please please speak up. It says Martel in the picture. That looks like a Shrike missile to me. Oh no, okay, it is Shrike. It's, yeah, sorry, it's the way I read it. It's Shrike, anti-radar missile. So it's got Martel, yeah, it's got Martel on the wings. That's the Shrike, okay. It's just the way they've laid it out. It's a bit confusing. My fault. My fault. I didn't think they'd do it. And then you've got all the preparations going on here at Ascension with the Vulcans. Uh, getting their teams ready to send them off on their way. Famous photograph, two Vulcans. And you've got the, the results of the raid where you can see the Port Stanley uh, airfield is ablaze on the left. And the runway has got the holes in it. The car is damaged. Searching for the task force. Of course they had a Boeing 707, the Argies. They were using that for uh, surveillance. They were very nearly shot down. There's a famous uh, story where one of the um, one of the HMS Invincibles, uh, 801 Squadron, I think it was, was uh, sent up to intercept them, but they didn't actually have the permission to shoot down, so they let it go, and they just warded it off away from the task force. But they were very brave because I don't think they know how close they were to being shot out of the sky. The Chinook coming of age, how vital the Chinook was. If only we'd had more of them, though. Hmm. And then you've got the Skyhawks in battle. I mean, they did a great job, considering they're not the most, you know, modern or, even then, wasn't the most modern or spectacular aircraft. They were very well flown, it has to be said. Look at that. The Herx, Hercules, very good this actually, it's got a lot of stuff in it. And then I've got this um, pull-out spread with the Sea Harrier FRS-1s. All three squadrons of the British Air, here we are, the Sea Harrier, Sea Harrier Special. Oh, what is that? This is a great mag, I've got to say, for the money, this is very highly recommended to you. Uh, this, if you're interested in, interested in these uh, historic situations, then you really want to get yourself a copy of this. Because it's very interesting, it's got the Argentinian perspective, it's got the British perspective, it's all there. Look at that, all those images of the Sea Harriers at work. And Sharky Ward in the briefing room. There he is, what does it say here? Yeah, front left Sharky Ward. Oops, there he is. A little bit closer for you. There you go. With his beard. He's cracking a joke, to be honest. <laughs> and there we are. So, plenty of uh, information about the Sea Harriers about, you know, one of the things that was interesting I learned, I didn't know before as well, um, regarding the Sea Harrier FRS-1 was the, they had this Blue Fox radar. Now Blue Fox was really again intended as a maritime aircraft radar. So it has this sort of loop down radar, but it's really intended to be used overseas and they found that once they got over the Falkland Islands itself, it wasn't very effective because it didn't like background clutter, it couldn't couldn't pick out the aircraft. It was good at picking out an aircraft signature over water, but it couldn't really do it effectively over land, and um, and this did compromise it. And of course, later on, the FA2 they brought out, I think it was Frant, who brought out a much more advanced radar system. Um, but it was still very effective at um, you know for, for the air, for the cat role the combat air patrol role it was ideal. What it wasn't so good at was getting in down low of the island itself. Obviously, and there, sorry, there is the FA two, and it's talking here about the new radar. Does it, does it name it? Yeah. I mean, obviously, they became a lot more advanced. For all the learnings from the Falklands were um, integrated. There's uh, Dave Morgan. I mentioned about the story with the, the Puma helicopter he hit. 
and there we go. So there you have it. Um, that's the so these books if you want them. Uh, I'll zoom you in so you can see the uh, the ISBN number on here. So this is the Air War in the Falklands first. So you've got there. It's from Osprey Publishing. There's your ISBN number. So if you freeze that image, you'll be able to get yourself a copy of that. And then, well, there's a few of these around, aren't there? These magazines, but uh, this is the Aeroplane Mag. Uh, I can certainly recommend that one to you. I think you'll find that very, very interesting indeed. Um, and there we go. I think that's probably uh, wrapping it up for me, commenting on the Falklands, really. Um, very unfortunate uh, conflict. Um, remarkable the way it turned out because Britain really shouldn't have been able to pursue the campaign the way they did. Um, lots of documentaries on TV at the moment which are all worth watching but some better than others. <laughs> uh, I didn't like the Channel 4 one a couple of weeks ago, it was very anti-British and it was all about all the mistakes we made and all this kind of thing. Well if you look at any war, if you study war, any conflict you'll find that that is quite typical. There's lots of errors get made by lots of people most of them think they're doing the right thing at the time and sometimes they're not and that's just life you know um, you can't criticize people in war when you are many many decades later sitting in a comfy chair or on your sofa with a beer or whatever so easy to criticize people these people went through hell on both sides frankly and it was really the most grim conditions the weather was bad the sea was bad you know the land was awful there wasn't much cover very difficult place to have a, a battle, especially when you 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 know neither side had any proper heavy armour, so everything's improvised. Um, and I think that it was remarkable that more people weren't killed. The thing that amazes me most about the Falklands, when I hear now, with the extra knowledge I now have, having studied it in quite a bit of detail, it's just astonishing that so few died. Actually, so few did die. It could have been, you know, four or five thousand dead men quite easily. So actually, I think that both sides got off very light, um, especially when you, you know, see these ships sinking. Um, and uh, was it the Sheffield? I think I think they lost. What was it? Twenty men, another twenty-five, thirty wounded. Amazes me, it's so low. Actually, you know, the thing burst into flames and became an inferno. Same with the the poor Welsh guards, um, Bluff Cove. You know. Absolutely incredible, really. Anyway, um, I just want to say, I, I just hope the Falklands can just be... Uh, it would be better if Argentina were to just uh, bide their time, I think, over over the future. Um, maybe things will change in terms of... Uh, maybe they won't. Maybe they'll just have to let it go, you know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to get into the politics of it at all. But I think that it's not worth fighting over. It isn't. Trust me, it's not worth fighting over. We don't want to repeat that ever again. And I think that then, over time, um, things do change in life. And maybe we can have a, a UN sort of governed island. I think that might be the long term future. But um, as long as the uh, occupants want to be British, then I think that you can't do anything about that. And you know, we did discover the island, so it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one. But it isn't worth violence. It isn't. You know, this world is very fragile, and uh, it, when you see the Falklands, you, you do sometimes wonder what it was all for. You know, people like Colonel H. Jones and all these young lads who, who went to their deaths on both sides, you know, these poor lads from Buenos Aires and other places. Was it worth it? I don't, I don't know if it was. I don't know if it was. Um, it would have been better to have continued the negotiations, I think. I think it's made things worse, not better. Um, for, for getting a long-term solution really so there we go there we go I always avoid politics and religion on my channel if I can uh, but it's tricky with this one because obviously it's still not really resolved but there we are I say hello to all our friends out there in Argentina I know I have at least two or three that um, tune into this channel from time to time so I hope you understand I've tried to be as sensitive and uh, sensible in the way I've presented this one um, but it's a very interesting uh, very interesting uh, conflict. I think it's something we don't want to ever repeat again and let's all live in peace together. And there we go. Anyway, thanks very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and please tune in for some more, perhaps more uh, model related videos coming in the very near future. And uh, thank you all for your attention. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Ding the notification bell to get early warning. And until next time, 
Thanks a lot. Take care of yourselves and bye for now.